Amen. You and I may not be the cream of the crop, but God intervenes. And when we pull together, God does great and wonderful things. Amen. Jimmy Hernandez from Colton has a twin brother, as we prayed this evening, that just had a heart attack on the job. And he thought it was just a pain, you know, just a passing uh, issue. But all of a sudden it went into his arm and then he realized it was more than that. It was actually a heart attack. And, and you know that heart attacks are very serious things. Uh, cardiac arrest is even more serious. And these sorts of things can put people into eternity. Jimmy called his brother, talked to his brother, went to visit him, and he actually prayed a sinner's prayer with him that he would get his heart right, and he's committed once he is uh, healthy and, and, and able to come, he's going to come back to church. Hallelujah. We thank God for that. God is at work, and God really does want to touch people's lives, but I want to talk this evening about having a right heart because we're going to read in our text where Peter is having a bit of a spiritual heart attack, and he is not uh, <coughs> doing well at this particular point in his life. And it would do us <clears throat> some good to take a peek at this and uh, I believe God to help us preaching on a right heart. So in Matthew 16, starting in verse 21, reading through verse uh, 27, from that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. He didn't say, Get behind me, bro. Get behind me, hermano. He said, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever does, uh, desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to to his works. Heavenly Father, we ask for your divine intervention. Give us revelation. God, speak to us <coughs> instruction, correction, encouragement to God, even dominion. We ask you to help every person within the sound of my voice and those that are online. You would inspire and work minister grace. We ask it in Jesus' name. So let's talk about a cardiac arrest or a heart attack tonight. Your heart determines your future. Proverbs 24, or 4, verse 23, we're all familiar with this. Above all else, guard your heart. This is the new uh, NIV. For everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issue with the issues of life. We're talking about an attitude of heart. We're talking about a state. Of the heart. And so on an airplane, there are various instruments that are there uh, for reasons of uh, safety and reasons of uh, being able to fly at difficult times. And so it's called an attitude indicator. Uh, there's a gyroscopic system, they call it, and it can determine altitude, it can determine horizon, and a number of other things. And what it does is it helps you arrive safely uh, to your destination. So <clears throat> quite a bit, you fly in an aircraft and you can see what's going on. You can see that you're upright. You can see what direction you're going. You can perhaps see to a degree your altitude. But when you fly at night or you enter into a storm and you can't tell what's happening, you must learn to depend upon these instruments in order to get to your destination. Life this evening has lots of storms. Life has uh, lots of times where you can't quite see what's happening in the natural, but this is where we must have a heart 
that is right that will get us through these times. So here's Peter in our text. He's like us. He, he's really no different than us. You know, sometimes he opens mouth and inserts foot. Sometimes he's a little too loud. Sometimes he's off course and, you know, has different things. He's married. He's uh, got a mother-in-law, but he's involved in ministry. And God obviously has chosen him to be one of the, one of the three inner circle, actually. But he's in a storm. Peter's in a storm. And uh, Peter's will and God's will are about to collide. And so it's a very, very uh, serious time, an important time. Psalms chapter 78, verse 37 says, For the heart, or their heart, was not steadfast within him, or with him, nor were they faithful in his covenant. In our text, the issue is the cost of discipleship. Jesus is saying, uh, this is what is going to happen. And Peter was out of sync with God's heart, uh, and he had other plans. And so there was a crisis of life here, and God is looking for right hearts. God is looking for people that can process things in a correct manner. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. God is looking for people that would have right hearts. And when God finds a man or a woman with a right heart, there is serious potential. I was talking to Pastor Lamb for just a moment this morning, and uh, there's a particular uh, individual that we both know and he lost his bearings in a, a serious storm in his life. And he went down and down and down. And, and unfortunately, he seems to be okay. But things really got out of control. And some things blew up. And one of the things Pastor Lamb said, it was very sad because this individual had such potential. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Bible tells us that King Saul had a polluted heart. It says, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look <clears throat> at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Can you say amen? Saul had polluted his heart and now King, or Samuel is going to Jesse and he's looking through Jesse's sons, and he knows that he has a man within his sons uh, that he's chosen to replace King Saul. Now, he tells Jesse, bring out your son. So he brings out Eliab, big, handsome, strong, probably kind of like the rock, you know, or Brad Pitt, or I don't know who the sexiest man alive is today. <laughs> I think there's a guy from India that's... One of the guys. But Eliab, oh, he was a fantastic specimen of a man. <laughs> and Samuel says, ah, must be the Lord's anointed. He's about ready to pour the oil. Whoa, 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 whoa. Not this one. What? <clears throat> and finally they get to David. But God doesn't see as man sees. He doesn't see as man sees. He looks at the heart. So Peter here has to decide <clears throat> God's will or my will. Do I want to do the will of the Lord or I want to do what I want to do? In Acts chapter 8, Philip is preaching in Samaria and God is moving. It's a very powerful time in the Lord. <clears throat> and... Um, there was a man by the name of Simon who saw what God was doing. There were people getting saved, people getting healed, people receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It was revival. God was helping them. But Simon, who was a sorcerer of sorts, says, I want that power that I can lay hands on people and they will be filled with the Holy Ghost. And I will pay for it. Now, that's a bad thought because you cannot buy things from God. 
Peter confronted him when he came and says, you are bound by iniquity and the gall of the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. There's problems in your heart, Simon, and you need to get your heart right because his heart was not right with God. I mean, he prayed a prayer. He said a sinner's prayer. He made a, a, a decision publicly that he was going to live for God, but his heart wasn't right. And in the midst of this revival, he missed the whole point of what was going on. And so it's very important that you and I would have right heart before God. It's crucial that your heart is right in the sight of God. So secondly, I want to talk about unresolved issues. Because we are all vulnerable, because we're all humans. Peter was human. Even though today we look at him as St. Peter, we look at him as, uh, you know, uh, he was an apostle of the Lord and he wrote two books of the Bible and half of the book of Acts is covering his ministry. <clears throat> and so Peter went on to do great things. But we are all vulnerable and these things begin to go unresolved and we can have problems. Listen to Jeremiah uh, chapter 17. <clears throat> this is kind of like God flying overhead. And he's giving us a picture of the heart of man. It says in Jeremiah 17, 9, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? One translation says incurably sick. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. This is an accurate diagnosis looking down at the human race, God searching the heart. Think about Noah's day. The Bible says God saw the wickedness of man and the intents and thoughts of their heart were wicked continually, and they were doing bad things 24-7. <clears throat> when we allow our hearts to dwell on rebellion, we allow our hearts to dwell on unresolved issues, it's a very dangerous place to be. And it gives place for the devil to operate. The inner working, workings of our heart is what can give the devil access. So Peter has been involved in full bore ministry, but things got a little tough. Things weren't going the way he had planned and the way he thought things would go. And all of a sudden, he shifted into a bad direction. Now, how many know things don't always go the way we plan in life? Things don't always go the way we want them to go. And so here's Peter making a few statements to the Lord, pulling him aside and rebuking him. And Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. Now, I've been called a lot of things, <clears throat> but I don't think I have ever been called Satan. And I doubt if Peter had ever been called Satan before that time. I don't know how his marriage was, but. But he allowed something to reside inside of his heart. His inner disposition was open to the attack of hell. In John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 30, it says, I, Jesus says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. This is an incredible statement because Jesus says the devil's coming and he's got his agenda and he will snag people up that are within the realm of darkness and the jurisdiction of darkness. And Jesus is the prince of this world has nothing in me. There's nothing in my heart, Jesus says, that has any connection to what the devil wants to do. My, I was sitting in the house the other day, and I, was, I, I kind of peek in on what's going on with Russia and the Ukraine, and I'm sure uh, some, some of you are doing the same because uh, it's a very serious situation. <clears throat> and even now, the last I heard is uh, uh, Ukraine has uh, requested that, um, that uh, Russia would come to Israel and meet with leaders from the Ukraine, I believe it was. And it's interesting how Israel is getting 
pulled into the center of this. So Russia and Israel are key players. But I was listening to a report on Russia and Ukraine, and I began to think, wow, things could happen at any moment. There could be some war on a large scale. There could be rapture. And in my heart, I, I thought, I began to check my own heart. Am I harboring any unholiness in my heart? It, 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 because I don't know what's going to happen. How I many know we, we don't know the day nor the hour? And so when this happens, I get it. We're saved. We're trusting God. I get that. But still, there's that, <clears throat> there's that thought that, okay, am I right? Or is there something wrong in the disposition, dispos, disposition of my heart? So you and I cannot sympathize with sin. We cannot sympathize with the camp of the enemy. When we come to church, it's not just to be religious and do religious things. But at times, it's to allow God to examine our hearts. So we don't come into a disaster. See, the devil looks for areas in our hearts and in our lives that he, that he can exploit. And what we must do is we must learn to judge these areas in our lives. Because nobody knows us like God does and like we do. We must learn to judge these arenas. Unresolved issues that bring guilt. It's huge in our world. People that have guilt. David sins with Bathsheba. And he doesn't deal with that sin for an entire year. An entire year goes by. And, and the sin he did with your, uh, Bathsheba and her husband. Brushed under the carpet. Then Nathan comes along having heard from God. And he confronted David. The Bible says marriage is honorable. And the marriage bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, God will what? He will judge. When someone is guilty, one of the things that happens oftentimes is he or she begins to find fault in other people. They begin to magnify faults in other people, right? Let me get the speck out of your eye, brother. When well, you've got a log in your own eye. When you've got a telephone pole coming out your own eye. Nowadays, people find faults and they take to social media and they, they post things. Because it's everyone else that's messed up. And oftentimes this happens because there's guilt and unresolved issues abiding in their own hearts. Unforgiveness is a place where the devil can operate. It's a place where the devil can come and set up camp. Luke chapter 9, Jesus is down in Samaria, and they're experiencing a little resistance. And what do some of the disciples do? Lord, do you want us to call down fire like Elijah did and burn these fathos up? <clears throat> what did Jesus say? You don't know what, your sp what spirit you are of. That kind of takes a little, of the, uh, a little bit of the wind of uh, political divisiveness away, doesn't it? Unforgiveness and unresolved conflicts are devastating to the health and well-being of your life and those that look to you to feed off you, if you will. Sometimes things can be eating on us. They're eating us. You know, today there's warnings about all kinds of different foods. If you eat eggs and milk, you're going to have high cholesterol. If you eat meat, you're going to die of stomach cancer. If you drink coffee, you're going to die of a heart attack. And so on and so forth. And the reality is, as Pastor Mitchell said, it's not near as much as what you eat, but it's what is eating you. Unresolved issues that can be at work that we must bring before those. See, we don't know exactly what was going on in Peter's life. We don't know what was going on. But no doubt he was thinking some things through. And when Jesus brings us, it's not like he said, Lord, you got to help me understand this. No, no, no. He pulls Jesus aside in order to correct him. 
And this is the very thing that he was sent to the earth to do. So let's talk about the liberating decision. Because there is hope in all of this. And if you notice, Peter, he made it through. This is a common scenario. Peter and the devil <coughs> somehow started moving along the same lines here. Jesus tells Peter, the devil has desired to sift you as wheat. Now, if you know anything about <clears throat> threshing wheat, I'm guessing no one here has ever threshed wheat. But when you thresh wheat, you literally take the, the, the stem with, the, with the, uh, the, the husk, and it's got the, uh, there's a little wheat berry that you got to get to, but it's covered by all kinds of stuff. In it. And so you got to cut it down, and uh, you put it, for example, if you want to do it on a small scale, you put it in a bag, and you just start, bam, you just, bam, hit it on the ground. It'd be like, let's see, do I have anything in here? It'd be like here. And then you take it out, and the wind blows. And, and as you pour, you t you'll take the seeds that have been whipped up like that, and the wind will blow away the chaff. Because the little beans are heavier, they'll fall down. And then you got to do that several times. And I don't think they do that anymore. <laughs> Maybe if you really want to cook from scratch, you can do that. Make the best flour. But that's what the devil wanted to do to Peter's faith. Wanted to whip him up. The devil has asked Peter to sift you like wheat. And Peter knew exactly. The devil wanted to give him a shakedown. And he knows how to do it. Peter says, but I, or Jesus says, but I have prayed for you that your heart and your faith would not fail you, but you would make it through. And when you return, encourage your brethren. See, it's easy to say, Lord, I'll do your will. Maybe even make an altar call or send out a tweet. I'm surrendered to the Lord. I'm enlisted in the army of God. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. Soldier for God. But the problem is, there's someone sitting on the throne of your heart. And that someone is you. See, in our hearts is a throne. And we enthrone self. Most people enthrone self instead of Jesus. Jesus. Well, brother, you know, I'm kind of confused. You're not confused. Self is on the throne. I don't know what to do. Being confused is not the issue. Most often you are fighting against God's will for your life. And here's Peter. He's at a very difficult sp a spot. To, he says something completely out of line, and then Jesus reveals what's going on in the spiritual world uh, that he's already in battle for him. It's kind of like Ephesians 6. We have the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6, the breastplate of righteousness. And so it's not really some armor, you know, that you can get from first century Roman uh, archives but it's simply you making a decision to do right in your life. Just decide to do right. <clears throat> because sooner or later, you're going to enter a storm in your life. And if your heart is in the right place, you'll make it through. If your heart is not right then you're going to have a difficult time at best. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, listen to these words. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. 
<coughs> and if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? I'm going to read that again. The time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? Somebody said these words some time ago. In 1960, God judged the home. Parents. And in the 70s, God judged the churches. In the 80s, God judged individual ministers, televangelists, and he pulled their covers. In the 90s, he judged individual spirits and the hearts of men. <coughs> and we could go on and on. But you and I have to judge our own own hearts. The way to escape God's judgment is by you judging yourself. Because we can all point to things that are going on that are wrong. Here, there, and they, and him, and her, and all those things. But that really doesn't accomplish a whole lot. I know there's blame to be laid at times, but I'm here to tell you, you and I have to judge our own hearts. We just had a marriage seminar yesterday, or three of them. And you have to be able to judge your own heart or you will not survive. Today we have groupthink, right? <clears throat> People can't think for themselves. And how many know a whole group of people can be dead wrong? So what we have tonight is an option for a liberating decision. And that is for you to decide to do the will of God. Even when it gets difficult, even when it's unpopular, even when no one else is on your side to do the will of God. Many of you here got saved and your whole family was against you coming to church, for you being a part of a Christian church or whatever the case may be. But you had to decide to do the will of God. Because it's at the time where your heart is checked, amen. A right heart is formed when you make a decision that I'm going to do right. There's something powerful about your choice to do what is right. <clears throat> Peter had a few rough days and a few stormy days. And things were not right in his heart. And eventually it came out. I've seen it happen with individuals. Uh, they seem to be doing well and everything's yes and amen until something goes wrong. <clears throat> and overnight, they are a completely different person. One of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life. But Peter made it through, didn't he? That's good news. Jesus says, I have prayed for you. I saw this coming, Peter, and now it's finally come out. So you and I are going to have those days where it's going to be cloudy. It's going to be dark. We don't fully understand what's happening. There may be some unresolved issues at work inside of our lives, but if you'll keep your heart right. See, running away in your new sports car is not going to fix things. <coughs> Many people run away from things, and it doesn't fix it. I'm going to run away to Montana, Pastor. Okay. And do what? Work for Dairy Queen? What are you going to do? Everything over there going to just be wonderful and hunky-dory, and I'm going to live off the land, Pastor. But the issue is the condition of your heart. If you'll keep your heart right, you'll be more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. See, we're, we're not here to be religious. Much of Christian TV is just appearance. It looks good. It looks good. Everything looks good and wonderful. And <clears throat> they never have people have bald spots on those shows. Never have people with bad teeth. <clears throat> Everybody looks, you know, semi-movie starish. That's Christian TV. And if you're living and feeding off Christian TV, I feel sorry for you. Because when the real battle comes, the issue is where your heart is. 
you will be a right with God in your heart. God is looking to and fro. He's got a meter that can tell. If we'll simply surrender to God on a regular basis, by the way, keeping our hearts right with God, we can make it through life and make it through victoriously. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads this evening. Thank you, Jesus. Grace is God's attitude toward the lawbreaker. Mercy is God's attitude toward the distressed. Therefore, grace always precedes mercy. <coughs> you may be distressed, but first you got to get saved. First you got to give your life truly over to Jesus. And if you'll do that, God can do a miracle my friend, in your life, the issues of life flow out of the heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. Above all things, guard the condition of your heart. And God will see it through. See, what do the doctors do when they first see you? They put their stethoscope to listen to your heart. <coughs> How's your heart doing, young man? How's your heart doing, ma'am? How's your heart doing? That's the beginning. That's the key organ. Spiritually is the same thing. If our hearts will be right with God, God can pull us through all kinds of situations and scenarios. Over the years, I've seen people make it through all kinds of difficulty. It doesn't mean they won't have a rough time. It doesn't mean they won't have rough periods. You may be going through a rough period. <clears throat> and instead of God just fixing everything with the snap of his finger, I think what's more important is that you would get your heart in the right place. Humble yourself before God. Submit yourself to him. Draw near unto him. Ask God to touch your heart afresh. This more, this evening, this sermon <clears throat> may not really address you in your particular life. It addresses us all in one way or another, but something you can, you can file away, or perhaps there's someone you know. They're going through some issues in life, and their heart is not right. And you can pray in that direction, like Jesus prayed for Peter. And when you get an opportunity, you can speak into their life and bring healing and bring hope. Hallelujah. You're here tonight. You're not saved. It's so crucial that you would genuinely give your life to Jesus. We're not here to be religious. We're not here to play games. We're here to be right with God. And that's where life begins. Anyone at all you'd like to pray this evening, we'll pray with you. You lift your hand. You're online with us tonight. I'm here to tell you that God has a plan for you. God has purposes in, in mind for you. He knows you. Uh, far better than you will ever know yourself. And he's willing to work in your life, bring salvation, bring direction, and bring help. Hallelujah. If you'll believe him, amen. Let's all stand this evening. We're going to take time in the presence of God. If you'd like to come, find a place to pray.